Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow, the second of the Splinter Cell games, was released on March 23, 2004 for PC, Nintendo GameCube, PlayStation 2, and original Xbox. Unlike the first game, which was developed by Ubisoft's Montreal branch, this game was developed by its Shanghai branch. Today, I would like to give a retrospective and analysis of the PC version of this game. What's up guys, Acer Thorn here and welcome to another video game discussion and analysis of video. I do these retrospective videos on a regular basis, so if you'd like to see more of them, hit that subscribe button to stay notified. Now before I continue, I want to make a full disclosure that I will not be reviewing the multiplayer of this game, as the servers to play it on were shut down long ago, and unlike Chaos Theory, there aren't even any unofficial servers to play the multiplayer on. Well, that plus the fact that I'm really not that much of a multiplayer guy anyway, so I wouldn't know how to judge the multiplayer even if I could play it. So this retrospective will be exclusively about the single-player campaign. One thing that makes this game rather unique among the Splinter Cell games, at least for the PC version of the game, is how many hoops you have to jump through just to be able to play it. For reasons I will get to in a minute, this game is not available on any official digital storefronts, such as Steam, Epic Game Store, or Good Old Games. There are disc copies of the game out there, and they are relatively inexpensive. But even then, both the game's single-player and multiplayer have been discontinued. The multiplayer is understandable considering how old the game is, but even the single-player game is still unplayable because the game calls for an always-online DRM, and those servers have been discontinued. This, of course, would likely be a non-issue if the game were simply available on any of the aforementioned digital storefronts, but it's not. The reason for this is because, even if you download a pirated version of the game to get around the defunct DRM problem, which would be perfectly legal by the way, I'll provide a link in the description to my source which proves that it is in fact legal to pirate the game under these conditions, you would still have another problem. Modern graphics cards have a difficult time rendering this game's lighting. The lighting appears erratic and all over the place. In most Ubisoft games, this would be a mere cosmetic problem. At worst, it would be a break in immersion. But in a game like Splinter Cell, where staying in the shadows and therefore being able to tell where the shadows are is an essential gameplay mechanic, such a bug renders the game entirely unplayable. Now, there is indeed an unofficial fix for this problem. The footage for today's retrospective was recorded using that fix. So, some of you might think to yourself, well, why don't they just re-release the game with that fix already installed? Well, the answer to that can be summed up in a single compound word. Copyright. See, this game's EULA, which is contained entirely within the game's instruction manual, does not contain any language stating that Ubisoft owns or has the rights to use any custom content that you create for this game. Even if it did have that, if the recent controversy surrounding Blizzard and its Warcraft 3 Reforged EULA is any indication, the fans would likely have had a cow anyway. This means that the modder who originally created this fix owns the copyright to that fix. This, in turn, means that if Ubisoft ever wanted to use the fix for any commercial gain, such as to re-release Pandora Tomorrow on digital storefronts, they would have to pay royalties to that modder. Sure, there have been plenty of instances where game companies have used pirated copies of their games to get around their own shut-down DRM, but that's primarily because the game pirates who created those copies would have to publicly sue the game companies in order to collect royalties, which in turn means publicly ousting themselves as game pirates. Meanwhile, the modder who created the lighting fix for this game was well within his legal rights to do so, so he doesn't have to keep himself anonymous and could easily sue Ubisoft for copyright infringement if they tried to use his fix without royalties. This means that in order for Ubisoft to re-release this game for profit, and they're not going to re-release it not for profit, they would have to either A, track down the modder and negotiate the rights to his mod, 
and tracking him down may be a pain in the ass and he may demand an arm and a leg even as is, or B, create their own lighting fix patch, one which achieves the same end result as the fix of allowing the lighting to be rendered properly, but where the source code is substantially different enough from the existing fix that it constitutes an original work, which, for all we know, could be impossible. For all we know, that modder may have discovered the only way to fix the lighting problem. But even if either of those two options were possible, is there really a compelling reason for Ubisoft to do either? Except for the most hardcore of Splinter Cell fans, there really isn't that much of a demand for this game to be re-released on digital storefronts. It's not the first game in the series, it's not the most popular game in the series, it's just kind of... there. Sure, Double Agent and Conviction don't have a whole lot of market demand either, but at least they're a simple matter of upload the game to Steam, boom, you're done. To re-release this game in a playable state would require either a small team of developers pulled away from making new games, or would require detectives to find the modder who made the fix and hire attorneys to negotiate a contract with that guy. Either one would be expensive as fuck, and for a game like this, where there's really not a whole lot of demand, it's just not a good move in a pure business sense. I'm sorry, my fellow agents of Third Echelon, but unless a miracle happens, it honestly looks like Ubisoft is going to just let this one go. So once you jump through all those hoops and finally manage to begin playing that damn game, how does the game itself fare? Well, one thing I noticed right off the bat is that the quick save and quick load keys could no longer be reassigned. For the quick save button, this wasn't a problem since I usually use the F5 key for my quick saves anyway. But for quick loading, I am used to using the F9 key, so having it permanently mapped to the F8 key and being unable to change that took some getting used to. In my retrospective of the first game, I mentioned how the shooting felt like my aiming was based on RNG even when I was standing completely still. Well, in this game, I don't simply feel that way about the shooting, I know it to be the case. This time around, it's explicit, there is indeed an RNG to your shooting, even when you're standing still. This is evidenced by the fact that you have an alternative aiming reticle with your pistol. Press Alt-Fire, right-click on the mouse by default if you're playing on PC, and the aiming reticle will switch to a laser pointer. However, the laser pointer still waves around, even when you're standing still. Honestly, although I still feel that this random targeting is bullshit, I have to admit that this is a minor improvement over the first game. At least this time around, the game is much more transparent about the randomness. I can't blame it on a lack of polish this time around, since the waving laser pointer demonstrates that it is indeed a conscious choice by the game designers, and at least this time around, the laser pointer aiming system means that hitting your targets requires good timing, so it is still skill-based rather than luck-based as it should be. Sam doesn't really have any new toys or gadgets at his disposal this time around, but the way they are implemented is much more straightforward and intuitive. Your non-weapon tools, such as your lockpick and your optic cable, are much more intuitive this time around. In the previous game, you had to equip the lockpick and optic cable to your weapon slot and then use the primary fire button while next to a door in order to use them. Here, if you need to pick a lock, you simply go to open the door and the game opens the lockpicking minigame automatically. If you want to use your optic cable, it's still kind of awkward, but it's the sort of awkward that I'm used to having played a buttload of Chaos Theory. You hold down the button to open the door, and, with the button held down, use your WASD keys to select the optic cable from a menu. I remember as a kid finding this rather awkward, but if you've played Chaos Theory to hell and back, you should be used to this interface. While Sam doesn't have any new gadgets at his disposal, 
He does have a new ability, the ability to whistle, and oh my god, this power is OP. I had honestly forgotten just how OP this whistle ability was, as they do a much better job of balancing it in Chaos Theory and in later games. Here, the guard will always come to the exact spot you were when you whistled, linger for only a couple of seconds, and then turn around and go back to his normal routine. This means that all you have to do is stay in the dark, whistle to a guard, and then take a couple of steps back. He'll come to your position, but if you're in total darkness, he won't see you. Then he'll turn around, giving you a perfect opportunity to grab him from behind or knock him out, and it always works. Unless he has some backup or a hound to sniff you out, the game is basically whistle to win. It practically takes all the challenge out of the game in most areas. I found myself having to resist the temptation to use it because it felt like a cheat. You still never interrogate anyone for door codes in this game, which is a real bummer. At first I was going to give this game a pass, since at least this time around the game didn't actually teach you to interrogate people for door codes, only to then never have you actually use that ability. However, the game loses whatever pass it may have earned in this regard about halfway through the fifth mission in the game, when the game actually teases you with the opportunity to do this only for Lambert to shoot that idea down. Dono changes the passcode for entry twice daily. He doesn't write it down. He gives it verbally to his three top lieutenants on site. So I grab one and make him talk. No, we need to stay discreet. We can't afford to have Sedono panic and skip a call. Use the sticky cam to overhear those conversations. Details on your opset. I have to wonder why the game even bothered to include that line. If I didn't know any better, I would think that the game developers knew the player would be expecting to be able to interrogate a guard for the door code, so they wanted to expressly disavow the player of that intention. However, bear in mind that there hasn't yet been a single moment in the entire franchise other than the tutorial for the first game where you interrogate anyone for a door code. At this stage in the franchise, the player should not be in the groove of interrogating people for door codes, so why even include that line in the first place? It stood out to me because I've played enough Chaos Theory and Double Agent that the lack of door code interrogations is jarring to me. But the game developers wouldn't have been armed with that knowledge of game design for games that didn't even exist yet. Overall, the gameplay is a minor improvement over the first game. However, it's only a minor improvement. It doesn't do anything worse than the first game, but it doesn't really do anything truly ambitious either. I didn't cover graphics in the first retrospective because, quite frankly, there wasn't that much to say. They were part of the course for their console generation, so what else can I say about them? Well, in this game, the graphics offer a bit more variety. You're not just sneaking predominantly into office buildings this time around. You're sneaking through African villages, sneaking through dense jungles, sneaking into heavily guarded TV stations. Although I have to wonder why Sedona was even bothering to get on television, considering that even in the last game, terrorists were preferring to use the internet to broadcast their acts of terrorism, but it makes for an interesting level. However, the improvement in level graphics is offset by a huge reduction in character animatronics. This game predates the advent of motion capture, so I don't expect true-to-life body movements, but come on guys, you could have done a little better than this. The mounts appear to only have two animations, open and closed. It honestly feels like these cutscenes were designed to be dubbed in as many languages as possible, so the other language voice actors don't have to worry about lip-syncing matching up, and they could instead just have their voice actors record as many syllables as there were mouth flaps on screen. Meanwhile, the character models look like complete shit. 
In the levels, Sam Fisher looks fine, but in cutscenes, it looks like his head is flat. He looks like Frankenstein's monster. So overall, one step forward, one step back in the graphics department. Improvements in some areas, downgrades in others. As for the sound, that's another area where I have to say one step forward, one step back. On the one hand, I like how this game upped the diversity of background music. In the first game, there were different tracks for each level, which was cool. However, there was only one track for each level. Whenever you had a shootout, it was always the same musical piece every time. But in Pandora Tomorrow, each level not only has its own background music, but also different music for when the guards sense your presence but don't know you're there, as well as when you're discovered and the guards are shooting at you. The problem with that, however, is that you'll almost never hear half of these discovered tracks in the actual game, because in about half the missions in the game, any alarm means an automatic game over. Though I'll discuss that in more detail when I discuss the individual levels. And due to some pretty shoddy programming, NPCs will usually radio in for an alarm the nanosecond they actually detect you, before they even have enough time to say even a single syllable into their walkie-talkies. However, while this game improves slightly upon the first game in terms of soundtrack, it takes a serious nosedive in terms of voice acting. For starters, Don Jordan, the voice of Lambert in four of the five games he's appeared in, as well as Claudia Besso, the voice of Grimm's Daughter in every other game in the series, do not reprise their roles as Lambert and Grimm's Daughter in this game. Instead, for reasons that have never been clarified by any of the parties involved, Dennis Haysbert takes up the voice role of Lambert in this game, and Adriana Anderson takes up the role of Grimm's Daughter. That alone, however, is small potatoes. Haysbert and Anderson may not be the voices I'm used to, but they do all right jobs as Lambert and Grimm's daughter, respectively. No, the biggest tank in voice acting quality comes from the side characters. In the first Splinter Cell game, I couldn't tell one foreign accent from another. It seems that the side characters only had two accents, American and foreign. No specific nationality, just a generic foreign accent. Now, maybe this is because, as a stupid American, I can't really tell the difference between a Bangladesh accent and a Nepalese accent. Kind of like how many people from that part of the globe often have trouble telling the difference between American, British, Irish, and Australian accents. But you know what? I know damn well what a British accent sounds like, and even in the mission that takes place in the British Ministry of Defense, the characters still have generic foreign accents. Not just the ambassadors either, but the people who work there full time too. I need a kernel down here. We're trying to get through a retinal scanner. That being said, I'll take the voice acting from the first game over that of Pandora Tomorrow any day. Pandora Tomorrow gets rid of even the generic foreign accents, leaving only American accents in every level, no matter how little sense that makes. Hell, at some points they don't even try to hide that their accents are American, like this NPC in the first mission. You must be my blind date. I can just picture that voice actress in the recording booth twerking her head while saying the line, like American black women like to do. Look, I get that Ubisoft's Shanghai's team didn't have as big a budget as its Montreal division, but the voice actors for the side characters aren't even trying to get in character. Did these people even fucking care about turning in a passable performance? So, overall, the graphics and sound for this game are roughly equal to those of the first game, but only because they improve in some areas but downgrade in others. The improvements more or less cancel out with the downgrades, so it keeps the same overall quality. So the game begins in a rather weird way. 
You begin the game handcuffed and having to use the lockpicking minigame in order to escape from your own restraints. Now, you'd think this means that you start the game already taken prisoner and having to escape your jailers, but nope. As soon as you break free of your restraints, you are in the headquarters of Third Echelon and getting briefed on your next assignment. This begs the question of why Third Echelon would bother putting Sam in handcuffs. If this was just Sam being expected to do basic training even when he's not out in the field, just to keep his skills sharp, well, that's never clarified at any point in the game. That would have been a great way to contextualize the tutorial in-game, but sadly the game developers didn't go with that option. Instead, the first mission doubles up as the in-game tutorial as well. Sometimes this level's purpose as a tutorial seems painfully obvious, like in this moment, which I assume is meant to teach the player how to interrogate NPCs, where Fisher gives this line. I've got a man in my way, Lambert. How flexible is my zero fatality mandate? Considering that Sam has already been on several of these missions already, he should already know damn well how flexible these mandates are, as well as how to sneak up on people and grab them from behind. What makes this moment even more jarring is that this isn't even the first time in this mission that there's been a man in his way. In this section of the game, which is designed to teach the player how to move from wall to wall, there's also a man in your way, just like in the interrogation tutorial, his back is to you and you can easily sneak up on him. Honestly, these two moments should have been switched around. Then it would have at least made some sense. Speaking of which, I hate the fact that this mission has a mandate on no kills and no alarms. It's only the first mission, the difficulty for the first mission, especially one that is designed to double up as a tutorial, should be rather lenient. This is especially frustrating in this section of the mission, where there are three guys in this room, and there are several fires which provide light that I can't shoot out. Getting past this section was a pain in the ass during my recent playthrough. It would have been so simple if I were allowed to simply grab one of them and shoot another in the head. The only reason I was able to get past this section is because the AI is so goddamn stupid that I can literally fire a bullet right past his head, shooting out the light that is right behind him and he only gets a little suspicious. An enemy in Chaos Theory would have instantly noticed me and started firing at me right away. This is just straight up bad game design. I should not be forced to exploit the stupidity of your AI just to complete the mission. That can certainly make for some funny viral videos, and it can also be used for highly optimized runs such as speed runs or world record high scores, but it should never be mandatory just to complete the game in the first instance. After that annoying section, you make it into the courtyard. Turns out there's a guard on top of the tower wearing night vision goggles. To avoid the night vision goggles, the mole you're meant to meet up with you, you know, the woman who isn't even trying to make her voice sound remotely foreign, has set up a spotlight and you're told to stay in the spotlight so the amplified wavelengths for the light cause you to be obstructed in night vision. This seems like an interesting mechanic except for one problem. This never comes up again. Hell, at least the wall kick f comes up at least once more in the entire playthrough. This just seems like the game's equivalent of interrogating people for door codes. It's taught to you in the tutorial, but is never used again after the tutorial. So anyway, your first mission is to rescue one of Sam Fisher's old friends named Doug Shetland. Hmm, I wonder if he'll be important in any future games. Once you do that, he gives you some SD card and PDA with some communications written on it in a language neither of you understand. After that, your objective is to reach that totally not American lady and get it translated. After you get the intel you need, you can move on to extraction. At this point, Lambert relinquishes the mandate on not killing anyone, but there is honestly no point this late in the mission, as there's only two more guys left anyway, and luring them into the shadows to knock them out is a cakewalk thanks to the almighty whistle ability.
So this intel we gathered leads us to a cryogenics factory in Paris. This is the first mission in the game where you're allowed to kill and set off up to three alarms. One thing I noticed during this playthrough that I somehow missed when I played this game as a kid is that if you go long enough without an alarm, the alarm stage returns to normal. That's certainly weird. Anyway, even in sections where you aren't strictly required to knock someone out in order to progress, e.g. after grabbing them to use in a retina scanner, I have found that knocking people out it really makes your life a lot easier. The game clearly seems balanced on the assumption that you're going to knock out guards, and it really becomes a pain in the ass if you try to move forward without knocking them out. You're practically guaranteed to get spotted if you leave anyone conscious to spot you. So giving each guard the old love tap quickly becomes one's preferred method of progression. This is the only mission in the game to have motion detectors as well as obstacles. Motion detectors are essentially the opposite of cameras. Cameras can see you, but they don't have any means of detecting audio. With motion captures, you can walk right in front of them, but you have to move slowly while you do it. It's certainly an interesting obstacle, and I'm kind of disappointed that no other game in the series, or even any other mission in this game, uses them. Your first objective is to find out who the elusive, mortified penguin is, and honestly, the way this game handles that objective is pretty dumb. Basically, there's one computer in the entire complex which gives Fisher the necessary information, and the only way to find the intel you need is to check every computer using trial and error. This is just tedious. Once you've got the access codes you need to progress, you suddenly have to defuse a bomb. This honestly just feels like padding. You could easily have just moved on to the next section of the mission and nothing would have felt out of place. Diffusing the bomb isn't even that difficult. There's no bomb diffusing minigame. You literally just walk up to the bomb and press a button. Honestly, not only is this side mission a complete waste of time, but it completely breaks the immersion that the mercs don't get suspicious about why their bomb didn't go off, or why they don't just plant another one. Once that nuisance is out of the way, our next objective is to sneak into a cryogenics factory where people's brains were frozen so they could be reawoken in the future. Now this I have a problem with. The first Splinter Cell game was developed around existing technology. They didn't want to give Sam any gadgets that couldn't be replicated in real life. The only gadget he received that wasn't available at the time was his tri-lens goggles. Combining night vision and thermal vision into one set of goggles wasn't possible at the time, but they decided to go with it anyway for two reasons. One, it gave Sam Fisher and the Splinter Cell franchise an iconic trademark logo, and two, it would have been a clunky game mechanic to have Sam remove one pair of goggles and put on another, especially in situations where he has to do it one-handed or no-handed. This cryogenics factory breaks immersion for me because it isn't based on existing technology. You cannot freeze someone's brains and then thaw them out later, put them in a new body and have that person be alive, let alone have all the memories of his past life. This is just straight sci-fi, which undermines one of the core design mandates behind the Splinter Cell franchise. We get a decent platforming section in the second room, where we have to hang on to the ledge while timing our movements so the liquid nitrogen doesn't hit us. I have to marvel, though, that the NPCs in this game are not programmed with the simple ability to, you know, look down. Like I said earlier, the exploitation of stupid enemy AI should not be required simply to complete the game. We then finally reach our objective. Somebody has locked himself in a cell to, so some terrorists can't get to him. We find him through the air duct. Hey, a non-obvious route to our destination instead of just going through the door for a change. And after a brief conversation, we have to make like a banana and get out of there before the terrorists use explosives to blow the door open. We basically leave this innocent guy to die, something that Lambert actually admonishes us for. Frankly, I wish the game would have given us a way to save him because I agree that we shouldn't have done that.
After that, you're tasked with hopping on board a train and interrogating Soth to make sure he's still a double agent loyal to the CIA and not a triple agent loyal to Sedono. This is one of the most iconic missions in the game, but quite frankly, I have to say it's a bit of a letdown for me. For starters, you are once again reduced to zero alarms and zero fatalities. This means that, so far in this game, enough of the game's missions have been with this mandate that it could override a presidential veto. Now sure, this train is comprised predominantly of civilians, so not being allowed to kill them certainly makes sense. But why can't it just be the civilians who I'm not allowed to kill? One thing I definitely like about this mission is how Sam at one point has to crawl underneath the train and shimmy across a pipe to be able to reach his destination. In-game, Sam is experiencing no resistance whatsoever. This is just as easy as any other time he shimmies across a pipe. It's just the background which creates the illusion of high speed. But in-universe, this has to be Sam's most strenuous task of his entire career. I would totally like to see someone like Game Theory, or Because Science, talk about how tough it would be to hold onto a pipe like this while the train is moving at such high speeds. There's also another optional set piece where Sam is hanging on the side of the train, which in universe has to be even tougher since he's relying solely on his arm strength to do so, and at one point even does it one-handed. Sam Fisher might look lean, but he has to be fucking ripped underneath that wetsuit. As we reach the car where Soth is residing, we are told that he has a fake leg, the one we heard about during the tutorial interrogation. We are able to find him by using our thermal vision and finding the guy whose leg doesn't give off heat. Now I must admit, that is certainly an interesting application of Sam's thermal vision, so kudos there. However, that's where my praise of this mission ends. We talk to Soth, who now has the nickname Poindexter for some reason, even though that nickname never actually comes up after this mission. Couldn't you have just used the nickname Mortified Penguin? That's the nickname that actually has some build-up to it. Anyway, he has to go and take a call, and both Sam Fisher and Lambert can somehow tell he's lying. I'm sorry, but that is total bullshit. It has been consistently proven that there is no such thing as a human lie detector. There is no behavior that one exhibits while lying, nor does anyone have any instinctual ability to detect lies. Anyone who thinks that they can tell when someone is lying is nothing but a fucking asshole with his head up his butt. And if those people are police officers, then they are nothing but cancer to the justice system because their complete unwillingness to accept their own fallibility is probably responsible for a large number of false convictions. <sighs> Who? We tap into his computer to get some intel, and then we're told to laser mic his phone call. Well, it sure is convenient that we just happen to have our laser mic for this mission, despite there being no way we could possibly have known that we were going to need it. Honestly, wouldn't it have been more immersive to simply give Sam his full arsenal of gear in every mission, and then there would be some missions when he just wouldn't use them? Anyway, while tailing Soth, I encountered one hell of a game-breaking bug. See, when I'm told to tail Soth, a timer appears on screen telling me that I only have 45 seconds to complete this objective. Naturally, I quick saved because of course I did, why the hell wouldn't I? Well, I got spotted by Soth and the mission was aborted. I reloaded my quick save and I only had 20 seconds on the clock. There wasn't even enough time for Soth to walk his slow ass over to the spot where he was supposed to take his call. I ended up having to restart the whole damn mission from the top. That is such utter bullshit. So when we finally laser mic the call, we find out that Soth is indeed in cahoots with Sedono. Of course, we still can't afford to kill Soth because Sedono would get spooked and unleash the smallpox plague if he knew the whole plan was gone tits up. So the best we can do is eliminate Soth's bodyguards and then extract. 
Not that we actually have to eliminate Soth's bodyguards. In my playthrough, I totally just slipped past them and grabbed onto the rope that was my ride home. Next, we're off to Jerusalem to recover a sample of the smallpox virus so a vaccine can be developed. Believe it or not, we once again have a zero kills and zero alarms mandate. I mean, Jesus fucking Christ, I'll take these mandates over the scripted shootouts of the first game, since these mandates still force us to, into stealthy playstyles, which is what Splinter Cell is supposed to be about. But the game developers really needed to understand how to design games so that the difficulty raises gradually over the course of the game. Not to mention that the no alarm mandate means that half the game's soundtrack is wasted because by the time we're discovered, we've already gotten an automatic game over so there's no opportunity for the discovered music to actually play. Our first order of business is to recover our SC-20K assault rifle. This section of the mission honestly just feels like Patty. As Sam himself asks at the beginning of the mission, wouldn't it make more sense just for him to have it at the beginning? We're told that it's because it's being outfitted for, with some upgrades as an excuse why we don't have it at the start. However, A, why couldn't those upgrades have just been given to me stateside? And B, I honestly can't tell any difference in how the SC-20K actually feels or fires any damn way, so this upgrade was a complete waste of time anyway. Frankly, it just seems like an excuse to have me go through the first leg of the mission without any means of shooting non-lethal projectiles, since I'm not allowed to kill. So I make my way through a platforming sequence, making sure to stay out of sight, since, you know, one alarm means a game over. Again. And I find that the guy who's upgrading my gun is currently being mugged by two thugs. I grab one of them from behind and the other guy grabs my contact and we have a Mexican standoff. Fortunately, I'm able to use my laser pointer to ensure I'm aiming past my ally's head while hitting the enemy in his head, so wait a minute, I just killed this guy. And I didn't get a game over. So I really am allowed to kill in this mission? Well then, why the fuck did Lambert tell me that I can't kill anybody? Why do you gotta fucking lie? So we get our SC-20K and then meet up with the person who should have been our objective from the start. A woman named Darla, who is able to get us inside the secret passageway that leads to Sedona's lab where they are growing multiple smallpox. After I rendezvous with this chick, she heads over to the location in question, and I'm required to stay behind and tail her without being seen. I must admit that this is a very satisfying section of the mission, all due to one simple reason. The focus is on stealth, which is what the focus should be on in a Splinter Cell game. It's admittedly a slow crawl, as Darla is often stopped by several cops for violating curfew, and has to come up with some random excuse for why she's out on the streets, though why she can't simply reuse the same excuse over and over again is beyond me. However, the second half of this sequence is rather baffling. It's one thing for the guards to not be allowed to see me, but at the halfway point, she says that I'll get a game over if she sees me. Why? She knows I'm with her. This makes absolutely no sense. So after we enter the elevator, Lambert tells us to murder Darla. Fisher, we need Dahlia Tal dead. Kill her. Don't think, just do it. This is the big morally ambiguous decision of the game. You only get a very limited window of opportunity to comply with this order, and Lambert doesn't tell you why you should follow it. When I played this game for the first time as a kid, I didn't comply. The order to kill an unarmed woman for no reason other than the voice in my head told me to just came so far out of nowhere that I didn't have time to adjust. Fisher also felt that way, seeing he needed some more warning before killing an innocent woman. However, after I recovered the smallpox sample, I found myself in a scripted shootout. And by now, you guys should know how I feel about those damn things. 
Turns out, Darla was a double agent that just wanted to take the paycheck being offered by the NSA while still helping America's enemies. If you kill Darla, you don't have to do the shootout. However, by the time you are told that she's a double agent, it's already too late to change your mind. Now, Fisher will lament that he wasn't given proper notice about killing her and didn't have time to mentally prepare himself for it. However, you can't rationalize this transgression from Lambert by assuming that he only just now received the intel for that Darla was a double agent, e.g. from another splinter cell. After all, Lambert was in a bit of a panic when he gave that order to Fisher. Fisher, we need Dahlia Tal dead. Kill her. Don't think, just do it. So one can easily assume that he was scrambling to get the word out uh, before it was too late. I freaking love this moment. It is deliciously morally ambiguous, not to mention it shows us what kind of moral fiber Fisher is made of. Fisher is often tasked with doing morally repugnant actions as part of his job, all in the name of the quote-unquote greater good of keeping America safe. This moment shows us that Sam still has a conscience and takes no joy in killing the innocent. Even if you choose to kill Darla, it may show that Sam takes orders blindly, but he won't like it one bit once he's had more than a split second to actually think about what he just did. Of course, there is one caveat to killing Darla. See, just before you retrieve the smallpox sample, there's a nearby weapon dump providing you with tons of ammo and non-lethal weapons. If you don't kill Darla, this weapons cache will prove invaluable to surviving the ensuing shootout. However, if you do kill Darla, then the weapons cache is still there. You can be packing all this heat and have nobody to use it on. Because the mission is basically over at that point, once you've got the smallpox sample, all that's left to do is reach the extraction point. And the only enemies in your way are three regular ass cops. Hardly worth it to arm yourself to the teeth just for them, and your gear will be reset once you start the next mission anyway, so it's not worth grabbing all that gear. So our next mission takes us to Sedona's base of operations in the city of Kandang, Indonesia. For some reason, known only to the geniuses at Ubisoft Shanghai, this mission isn't based off any real-life city or location. There is no such place as Kundang. It is an entirely fictional location made up solely for this game. Why? Every other mission in the game is named after a real-life location. Why make up a location just for this one mission? Would it have been so damn hard for you to simply place a map of Indonesia on the wall and then throw a dart at it, and wherever it landed, that's where the fifth mission sh would be located? Also, no kills and no alarms allowed. Honestly, at this point, I'm not that pissed off at it anymore. Mostly because I'm used to it by now, but also because we're entering the second half of the game. So by this point, such a progression in difficulty is warranted. Anyway, this is the second of two missions in the game to feature Douglas Shetland. He says he'll have snipers in position to provide you with a diversion in case shit goes south. However, his involvement in this mission is rather baffling. As I mentioned in my Splinter Cell 1 retrospective, Third Echelon's mere existence completely shits all over the US Constitution and would mean the almost instantaneous end of the president's reputation if its existence were ever made public. Well, we're learning chaos theory that Shetland is actually running a private, for-profit security agency, meaning that his employees in this mission are private citizens. However, in order for them to do their jobs in this mission, they would obviously have to know that Sam Fisher is a splinter cell which in turn means that they know that splinter cells are a thing. So by all logical accounts, the lid should have been blown off of Third Echelon's existence simply by getting a non-governmental agency involved in any way. Do you guys see why I tend not to focus too heavily on the stories behind these games? So this mission takes place in a jungle which provides a nice visual change of pace. 
Unfortunately, the tall grass provides no benefit to remaining hidden, whether that includes staying hidden yourself and hiding the bodies of those you knock out. The only thing which affects whether a body is hidden is the amount of light shining on it, and the only thing which affects Sam's ability to remain undetected is his light levels and the enemy's line of sight. What a complete waste of what could have been an interesting game mechanic. Oh, and if that wasn't enough for you, the first section of this mission decided to just spam these tripwires all over the place. Walk through these tripwires and they blow up, causing instant death. This is one instance where the tall grass really does obscure your vision, because if you thought this game was going to play fair, then I pity you. You should have realized this game wasn't going to play fair when enemies can set off alarms even if you kill them before they even had time to radio in for an alarm. So you have to use your heat vision to see where the wires are, and let me tell you, considering that this game doesn't even have native HD support, bear in mind that this was originally made for the original Xbox and PS2, you'd think that the wires would be relatively easy to spot once you turn on your heat vision, but nope, oh Christ, nope. Then again, it could just be the widescreen fix I'm playing the game with, but I'm not optimistic. So you make it to the second third of the mission, and the game really starts to lag to hell and back at this point. If you enjoy 20 frames per second in your games, this mission will make you come. There is no excuse for the game running this poorly. This game was released in 2004. My PC is running on an AMD FX 8350, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and a GeForce GTX 1070 Ti. I could run 50 instances of this game on this PC at one time and still have enough room to run my OBS studio to record the footage. The problem isn't on my end, this game's optimization is just complete shit. So we eventually make it to that section I mentioned earlier where it teases you about interrogating someone for a door code only to, for Lambert to shoot the idea down. Well, at this point, I actually came across a rather nasty bug. See, due to a problem I will talk about in a minute, I had to reload the autosave and redo the second third of this mission from the beginning. When I reached this section a second time, Sedono and his top lieutenants were supposed to move forward and I was supposed to follow them and eavesdrop on them. Well, when I reached this section a second time, they went into a nearby house and then didn't move from that spot. If I open up the door, Zidono would see me and I would get an immediate game over. If I walk around to the other side of the building and shot out a light through the open window, Zidono would instantly see me and I would get a game over. If I tried to move forward in the hopes that Zidono would be teleported to his correct location, Sedono would see me, and I would get an instant game over. I had to restart from the last autosave a third time to fix this problem. So anyway, once I made it past that section the first time, I went through a short stealth sequence where I ended up taking some damage. After that segment, I saw a medical kit hanging on the wall. Since I took some damage, I decided to heal myself up. Well, turns out that was a big mistake, because this is the section where I was supposed to use a sticky camera to eavesdrop on the conversation in order to learn today's door code for Sedono's office. If I waste time by trying to heal myself up, I'll miss the opportunity to hear the door code. S okay, so why didn't the game tell me that this was the moment I needed to eavesdrop? Put a timer on screen or something. In all the other instances when I needed to eavesdrop from afar, Lambert was kind enough to let me know the exact moment I needed to do so. Break with the laser, Mike Fisher. It's mission critical that we hear what Grinko and Mass say before they reach the top. So why can't they do that here? The third third of the mission involves you breaking into Sedona's office and bugging Sedona's phone so the USA can give the Pandora Tomorrow password without Sedona needing to do it. Then it's off to extraction, 
But before you can extract, it turns out that a few of Sedona's gorillas are waiting for you outside the back door. Fortunately, Doug Shetland has a small army of snipers ready to provide you with cover fire. This is the only mandatory scripted shootout in the game, and while I hate scripted shootouts in Splinter Cell games, at least this one provides you with some darkness to hide in, the enemies are distracted by the snipers, and it's also over very quickly. So overall, this scripted shootout has enough mitigating factors for me to find it only mildly annoying, rather than a complete killer of the game's mood and pace. So now that the USA has the means to stave off the smallpox outbreak indefinitely, you're headed to the island of Komodo in order to infiltrate a submarine in order to... Wait, why am I doing this? Nope, no reason given. Honestly, I kind of prefer it this way. I'd much rather have the game have no story at all than a story that makes no sense. The whole appeal of Splinter Cell is to sneak around to the shadows like a badass and use platforming to perform awesome feats of athletics. Much like a Mario platformer, you honestly don't need a story to motivate the action. The act of going through the levels is satisfying in and of itself. Not only that, but having a mission that doesn't have a story attached to it shows that this franchise could totally do with a level editor. Much like Super Mario Maker, a level editor in Splinter Cell could allow the fans of this franchise to create new content and new missions for the series indefinitely. En route to my destination, I did notice that there was this candle that provided some light. Now, in Chaos Theory, I could just blow this light out to create darkness, but apparently that wasn't thought of in this game. It's not a big deal, it's just something I noticed. But you know what is a big deal? This turret is just cheap. I can't get into this yard except by going through this door, but doing so necessarily puts me in the turret's way. I swear the only way to get past this section is to take a few shots before you can get around it and hope you come across a health pack soon. Once you get past the turrets, there's some cheap lasers in place that trigger an automatic alarm if you pass through them. It took some trial and error before I realized that I needed my thermal vision to get past this section. Once I realized that, it was easy to get past, but it was annoying. So it turns out that this is actually an Indonesian naval base. It only looks like our bamboo hut village on the outside, so it looks unassuming. Frankly, I'd say go ahead and beef up the defenses to the point where nobody in their right mind would dare try to storm it without backing of an entire army. That's what America does, but whatever, you do you. Once inside the underground bunker, our first order of business is to enter the control room and convince the guy to raise the submarine for us so we can get inside. There's actually an interesting sequence here where the guards in the submarine base radio in for an explanation. To avoid a scripted shootout, you have to refrain from knocking out this NPC for a little while while you force him to respond to the call promising to lower the sub again in a few hours. Once the sub is raised, your next objective is to actually get inside. Sadly, this is easier said than done, as you have to ride this slow-moving lift in order to get into position. This is a quasi-scripted shootout. Even if you shoot out the light in the lift, other guards from 300 feet away will still see you, notice that you're an intruder, and start shooting at you. Since you're stuck inside a lift during this sequence, this is essentially a rail shooter segment. I honestly wouldn't mind it so much were it not for the fact that the enemies can see you even if you're in total darkness. However, the reason I call this a quasi-scripted shootout instead of a full scripted shootout is because you do have the option of taking all the enemies out before you activate the lift using your SC-20K and its 6X zoom sniper ability. Since these guys are spaced so far apart from each other, you can pick them off one by one without worrying about the others hearing your gunshots. So I'll say that this just 
barely constitutes an avoidable scripted shootout, even though avoiding it requires you know it's coming and doing something you likely wouldn't do otherwise. So now you're inside the submarine, and honestly, this has to be the tightest quarters in the entire game. The train mission ain't got nothing on how tight these quarters are. What's even worse is that you can't kill anybody in the submarine, otherwise it would be seen as an act of war by the Indonesian government, which is precisely what we're trying to avoid. Wonderful. Fortunately, you are allowed to knock them out, which leads me to my next gripe. In this section, I saw a guard coming my way, so I hid in the shadows, waited for him to pass me, knocked him out, and got a game over. See, as it turns out, there was a retinal scanner that I needed him to unlock, which means I needed him conscious to do it. Well then, if Lambert knew this guy was so important to the point where he knew to instantly abort the mission because it was somehow now impossible to complete, why didn't he warn me that I needed this guy conscious? He didn't seem to mind giving me the heads up in the first game. You've got an incoming colonel, Fisher. Make the most of him. You'll need him conscious and cooperative if you want to unlock the retinal scanner sealing the door to the courtyard. Okay, now I'm finally in this room. I take out the two remaining guards and then run around like a dumbass for about six minutes before I finally find the one computer terminal I'm supposed to access. Fans of Chaos Theory may find this little nugget of dialogue rather interesting. Yeah, Echelon's linking them to a private military corporation, something called Displace. Hmm, never heard of it, and I'm pretty sure it isn't run by anyone I know. But I do know one thing, whoever these guys are, they're in for a red, white, and blue reckoning for being in cahoots with Sedono. Speaking of Sedono, it's now finally time to go after him, but not before we get in some sweet, sweet product placement. The Ubisoft Coffee Mug, only $99.99! Pester scream and yell at your parents until they finally break down and buy you one. It's more important than breathe. Well, it's just our luck that Sedono happens to be hijacking a local TV news station so he can broadcast his message. Anyway, I begin this mission outside with it raining cats and dogs. You would think that all the rain and thunder would allow you to be a bit louder without giving away your position, but apparently I'm too used to chaos theory where that is indeed a main gameplay mechanic. In this mission, you are allowed to use lethal force, even though such a ban would be totally excusable for the penultimate mission, but whatever. Except that there are some people who you can't kill. Are they civilians? If so, A, why haven't they been evacuated while Sedono is hijacking the TV station? Or does the Indonesian government actually condone Sedono's actions? And B, why can't the game make it more clear who is a civilian and who is a terrorist? Am I supposed to look for whoever has guns? Because this game's 2004 graphics, especially when I'm in night vision and the graphics are monochrome, do not lend themselves to noticing tiny details like that. As I tried to find a way into the TV station, I overheard a conversation from a pair of guards mentioning how they weren't wearing their typical night vision goggles. Frankly, I wonder why the player needed to overhear this. With the exception of that one guard in the first mission, no guard in this game has been wearing night vision goggles. So it's not like this has a change of pace for me. I did hear a line about how the night vision goggles aren't safe to wear with all the lightning happening, so maybe this was designed to warn me that if I'm wearing my night vision goggles whenever lightning happens at timed intervals, that will act as a conductor, luring the lightning to my location and causing heavy damage if not killing me instantly. However, I never once actually got harmed by lightning, despite lightning going off multiple times during my playthrough. Frankly, this entire conversation just seemed pointless to me. If it was meant to be mere flavor text, well, it doesn't actually tell me anything about the bad guys. It doesn't give them any kind of depth and it doesn't make them out to be anything more than gorillas who are detached from reality. So it fails on nearly every count. 
Oh, and do you guys remember the cheap ass set piece from the first game that had panning spotlights combined with landmines dotting the ground? Well, it turns out that the developers liked that set piece so much they did it again. In fact, they even upped the ante by having a sniper near the spotlight. Now granted, that sniper can easily be taken out with a basic sniper shot of your own, but honestly, if the best I can say about this set piece is that it isn't any worse than the same section from the previous game, which was already the worst part of that game in terms of cheap deaths even as is, that's not exactly high praise. Once we finally make it into the TV station interior, it basically becomes your standard Splinter Cell mission at that point. It only really starts to feel like a handcrafted mission once I've knocked out every guard and then rendezvous with this chick. Turns out she was able to, um, do some favors to get into Sedona's good graces. She says it was her smile that Sedona was a sucker for, but something tells me it was a lot more than just a smile. Anyway, she's authorized to use the retinal scanners for us. The only problem is that Soth has blown her cover and revealed her status as a double agent to Sedono, meaning the guards are under direct orders to bring her in dead or alive. One has to wonder, then, why they bother having a pleasant conversation with her. Why not just gun her down where she stands? All that does is give me a chance to take the two guards who are about to kill her out. On a side note, I have to wonder if Sedona has hijacked this TV station, then how did he have time to reprogram the retinal scanners to grant him and his men access? Or are Sedona's actions actually condoned by the Indonesian government after all? So I finally make it to the main auditorium, where Sedona was recording his big ass speech. This has to be the cheapest room in the entire game. And considering that this uh, same mission repeated the spotlight and landmines trick from the previous game, that's saying quite a lot. You can't kill Sedono, and you can't even knock him out. And if you think that's dumb, just wait until you hear the reason why you can't knock him out. You absolutely have to grab him from behind and keep him conscious. The problem with that, however, is that he's surrounded by guards. Killing or knocking out any one of these guards will instantly alert the rest of them to your presence, and Sedona himself has the ability to kill you in one shot, even if you're at full health. The only way I have found to complete this objective is to throw caution to the wind and just run up and bum rush him. Once I have him, his bodyguards will hold their fire because I'm using him as a human shield, giving me an opportunity to slip into the shadows so I can draw my gun without them seeing it, enabling me to pick them off with headshots. The problem with that approach is that THIS IS A SPLATTER CELL GAME! Going in gung-ho should never even so much as be a plausible option, let alone the only plausible option. Oh, and to add a cherry on top of the stupid Sunday, it turns out the reason you can't knock Sedono out is because you need him to open the retinal scanner so you can escape. No, seriously, that's the only gameplay related reason why he needs to be conscious. What. The. Hell. Up until this point, both games have had no problem simply having the door's locks be jammed until you've completed your current objective, and at which point the doors magically unlock to let you progress in the mission. What? You're honestly telling me that you couldn't have found a way to incorporate that here? For fuck's sake, the mission is basically over at this point. The only thing left to do is drag Sedono's sorry carcass over to the extraction point. Was it really so damn essential that Sedono be kept conscious just for that? Sure, there was a moment at the end where the mole looks directly into Sedono's eyes while talking about how much of a psychopath he is. Because he's conscious, that means he can see and hear everything. However, did the developers forget that Sof already blew her cover? Sedono isn't hearing anything about this woman he didn't already know! Now, as much as I harp on this section of the game, 
there is one part of this sequence that I found rather interesting. While dragging Sedonu around, Sam tries to interrogate him about the whereabouts of the last case of smallpox, and for once, Sam doesn't actually get a straight answer out of his captive. It's a real nice change of pace. In nearly every other interrogation I've come across in the entire franchise so far, though I admittedly haven't played Conviction or Blacklist yet, any time an NPC has any useful information to spill, he usually spells it with only temporary resistance, if even that much. Sure, there's the occasional comic relief character like that guy in Chaos Theory who felt it would be an honor to be killed by a ninja, but here, Sedono's non-cooperation is played completely straight. It's honestly a nice change of pace in a series where Sam can usually get reliable information consistently out of nearly anybody if he just squeezes hard enough. So after we bring Sedono in for more potent enhanced interrogation techniques than what Sam was able to deploy on his own, we learn that Soth is planning on unleashing the smallpox virus on the Los Angeles International Airport. This mission actually begins with a pretty epic cutscene. You're speeding down the street and begin the mission with a bootleg turn in your extraction van. If you're in that much of a hurry, why not give me a strict one hour time limit to complete the mission? It would definitely add to the stakes and make the final mission feel like a climax. Well, that missed opportunity aside, this mission does a rather passable job of feeling like a final mission. Not a great job, but a passable one. You can't set off any alarms, otherwise Soth will unleash the smallpox immediately, why he doesn't just release it immediately anyway is beyond me, but if you're asking for this game's plot to make sense, you're asking way too much. You also can't kill anyone, except the nine terrorists who are in league with Soth, because we have to remember that we're on US soil at the moment, and so killing anyone else means you're killing your own countrymen, not to mention because this is a private for-profit airport, the airport security still count as civilians. While I certainly like this idea in principle, the way it's executed is totally botched. The way you're meant to identify the terrorists is with your thermal vision. Grimm's daughter reasons that the terrorists must have gotten smallpox vaccinations to protect themselves against the ensuing smallpox outbreak, so they intentionally gave themselves fevers as their bodies worked to fight off the weakened versions of the smallpox virus, because, you know, that's how vaccines work. Because of this, the terrorists will appear as almost pure orange in your thermal vision, whereas regular airport staff will appear as the standard green and yellow. The problem with this line of thinking is that, earlier in the game, the citizens of the USA had undergone mandatory smallpox vaccines themselves, so the airport should already be brimming with people running fevers as their bodies fight off the vaccines. Ugh, this game's plot is dumb. One moment in this mission that I found rather interesting was in the luggage area of the airport. I wondered if the game would let me take a, the non-obvious route through the luggage conveyor belt. Sure, there are x-rays in those machines in real life, but that doesn't necessarily mean the game will think to program it in. To my pleasant surprise, the game developers did indeed account for that. Stepping inside the X-ray machine automatically results in a mission failure as that means the airport security will have noticed me as they were keeping an eye out for bombs and the like. Then again, if the game developers really have thought about that, then I have to wonder how they expected Soth to get his smallpox bomb through the airport security in the first place. Bear in mind that not only was this game developed in the years of 2002 to 2004, but it was set in the year 2006. Post 9-11 paranoia and airport security would have been at an all-time high, and the odds of Soth being able to just slip a literal bomb past the airport security in a post 9-11 world is ridiculous. Then again, this game was made in China, so maybe they didn't quite understand the post 9-11 sentiment. 
So you eventually make it to the final segment of this mission, a dark area that apparently serves as the source of the ventilation for the airport. Apparently their intention is to use the ventilation system to spread the smallpox virus, which begs the question of why they set it up as a bomb if they were just going to pump it through the air conditioner. When you finally kill all the remaining guards and make it to the bomb, you find that there isn't enough time to properly defuse it. Sam thinks on his toes and sneaks into a broom closet, dresses up as a janitor, and casually takes the bomb out in the open as casually as if it were a briefcase, Ugh. and then leaves it unattended. Airport security recognize it as a bomb and then call in the bomb squad to contain the explosion. I hate to say it, no I don't, but this is stupid. Sam only had 11 minutes to work with. In the cutscene, it is shown that there are about six and a half minutes left on the bomb's timer when the airport security recognizes it as a bomb. How quickly can Sam possibly move to find a broom closet that just happens to have a janitor uniform that fits him perfectly? Even then, six and a half minutes is not enough time for the bomb squad to make it there to cover up the bomb. I mean, in real life, I suppose it would be, since in a post-9-11 world, the bomb squad would probably just be on site in the airports anyways. But as we've established, the Chinese game developers didn't account for post-9-11 security when designing this mission. Not to mention, we clearly see the bomb squad truck actually pull up to respond to this call, meaning they had to actually depart from somewhere. So after the day is saved, Sam just meets up with his extraction partner and... nothing happens. No, seriously, just cut to the end credits. It's a no actual resolution to the plot, no falling action, just the bomb explodes underneath the shell, boom, we're done. This has to be the most anticlimactic ending in the entire series. For all its ups and downs, Pandora Tomorrow's biggest sin has to be its near total failure to make any kind of splash in the Splinter Cell franchise. As I alluded to at the beginning of this video, there's not really anything about this game other than its lack of availability that makes it feel special. Every other game in the franchise has something to call its own. Splinter Cell 1 was the game that started it all. Chaos Theory has branching paths and optional objectives. Double Agent has the Trust System, Conviction has Mark and Execute, and Blacklist has the Currency and Equipment Upgrading System. What does Pandora Tomorrow have? Aside from a few mostly aesthetic alterations, not a whole lot. Sure, it tightened up the controls a bit and lightened up significantly on the number of scripted shootouts over the previous game, However, if the biggest improvements this game has over its predecessor is that it doesn't have some of the worst aspects of the previous game, that's not saying a whole lot. The few improvements Pandora Tomorrow makes are the kind of improvements you would expect out of annual installments in a long-running franchise, even though this game had twice that development time. Now for the rankings. I honestly had to think hard about this one. Do I rank it above Splinter Cell 1 or below it? On the one hand, this game definitely made some improvements over the first game. On the other hand, it didn't do nearly as much as you would expect out of a sequel two years in the making, and in that regard fell rather short of the bar. But then again, the bar was raised higher for this game to begin with. So after thinking about it long and hard, I decided to place it above Splinter Cell 1. It may have only done the absolute bare minimum to be considered a sequel, but I can't think of anything in this game that is definitively worse than Splinter Cell 1, and it did make a few improvements, even if they were de minimis improvements. 
So, next time I'll do a retrospective on the third game in the series, Splinter Cell Chaos Theory. What score will it get? Y you know what? There's no point in delaying this suspense. Chaos Theory will get the top spot. I mean, I might as well just go ahead and rank it right now. It's above both Splinter Cell 1 and Pandora tomorrow, and if it ends up not getting the top spot overall, I'll be really surprised. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this retrospective, please hit that subscribe button for more videos just like it. Also, if you enjoyed my content overall, please consider supporting the channel directly, either with Patreon support or channel memberships. Silver and Gold level members and Patreon supporters are allowed to submit requests for video topics, and Gold members and Patreon supporters are allowed to directly assign me video topics that I am guaranteed to cover. In the meantime, however, I am Acer Thorn, and I will see you guys later. Peace!